the Grey Hat Beard podcast. Hello and welcome to show 30 of Grey Hat Beard, the modern workplace podcast where we talk about all things Microsoft 365. My name is Kevin McDonnell. I'm the Grey of Grey Hat Beard. I'm a solutions architect at uh, CPS and uh, forget to almost to say that just to keep everyone on their toes there. Nicely done there. My name's Alan Erdley. Um, I'm head of modern workplace at CPS and I'm an MVP as well. Uh, and my name's Gary Trinder. I am the beard of Grey Hat Beard. Uh, I'm a solutions architect at CPS and uh, MVP uh, for office development and PMP team member. And before we get going, Al, what is that on your hat? Uh, it is, it's, I have no a idea. Goat or a, a, a donkey or? Llama. A uh, llama. Uh, of course. So, yeah, if you are listening to the podcast, don't forget we are on YouTube as well. So you can uh, see ha- Al's hat every week. Uh, I, don't, I don't know if we've seen this one before. Not, certainly not for a while. Oh, so. you, you, it's not been on for a while. You yeah. have seen it before, but not for a while. So we we had last time we, we had Aaron on and we were talking about the joy of community. And before that, we had lots of Ignite news. Um, so we're in part one at the moment. We're going to cover the latest news. And uh, first up, one that I think came out this morning. More rumours than news at the moment, but uh, talks about Microsoft looking to buy Discord um, for more than $10 billion, which is an awful lot of money. Um for those who don't know, Discord is a, a text chat and voice chat uh, system. You can go and register for free. Uh, it's It was initially tied towards some of the more gaming um, side of things. Uh, I know my son's used it a lot. He, he does his raids on Destiny and has good chats uh, using Discord, but you can register for free on there, um, which makes me think that's a lot of money, $10 billion for something which is primarily a free service I, I think al you were saying earlier um, when we were talking beforehand that they they have nitro which is the more premium version yeah so I'm, and i'm not sure what the difference is but i mean it seems it's communities isn't it it's discussion boards around different things it's being able to go on have you have a discussion around the games you're playing um it's it's interesting. I've only come across it really with um, conferences that have been using it mm. for the for the text based chat because it's you know anybody can join. It's a little freer and opener than than Teams is, but it doesn't do all the video and everything that that we would use for for Teams meetings. But yeah, it'd be interesting to see how it fits into the Microsoft ecosystem in their gaming space, I guess, rather than. The sort of the more commercial spaces that we talk about around teams yeah i think it, the community side of it is probably a, a big thing as well so obviously you know kind of talking modern workplace and we're talking about something that's come from gaming is that you know a bit that discord has got a lot of integrations in it as well um so it can integrate with slack um so i've you i've seen those integrations work um it, things with spotify steam so it's got a good platform there being able to pull in information from from other systems but there are communities on there that are not gaming related so microsoft have a space on there for the dotnet community um you you can go in there and join and you've got all different channels and uh, it's again just like another discussion forum or a place where you know the um people can hold kind of like open mic kind of sessions you know we've heard about clubhouse recently which is very kind of like invite only you can think of that that you can just join a room with people in who are chatting about .NET and things like that you can get in and have a so, conversation with so them. basically it's like clubhouse but less opinionated that sounds um, quite nice <laughs> possibly yeah or maybe a bit like yammer yeah, I was just going to say, yeah. so uh, where are we going to have that community? Is it Teams? Is it Yammer? Is it Discord? Oh, it's, it, does op- it does open up some interesting possibilities, though, doesn't it? In terms of if you've got more open Yammer communities, you know, it's the same term being used in both platforms. Yeah. Mm. Same concept. I, I think my view on this, I, I think when Microsoft bought, bought Yammer even and bought LinkedIn, a lot of that was the graph technology behind it. It was making the connections. My feeling, very much an opinion here, not necessarily based on any fact, uh, is that Microsoft's looking to buy into that youth market almost. It's it's trying to position things like they did with Minecraft. It's getting certain generations thinking about Microsoft, not just as the one that the boomers use. It's getting to make sure that 
are, are they going to disappear in five, ten years' time because everyone's moved on to more modern things? Um, I, I'm sure I can't remember who it was, but someone tweeted, "My son's just called uh, Slack a boomer Discord," um, which which made me laugh. And I, I think <laughs> I like that. much as much as that is a, a joking comment, I think that is the worry for Microsoft. It's can we make sure we're positioning a new generation as they come through to think about us in a positive way? I, I think they've done a fantastic job with Minecraft and especially around the education sides and uh, sharing what they can do with that. I think they've done things with make code and getting kids being able to do code because they're now thinking about Microsoft in a positive light, not just those annoying people who do PowerPoint. And I feel that there's a there's going to be an element to this. I'm I'm hoping that they're, the aim's not going to be to merge this into Yammer, merge this into Teams. It's going to stand as something standalone that will sit with yeah. Slack and probably not really change much at all. And we have to remember that a lot of things don't have to merge into the you know, the workplace tools that we use. You know, Microsoft yeah. is not just yeah. the workplace tools. There's a lot more to it these days. Yeah, I, I see this as very much as it's, it's, again, Microsoft with the acquisitions of on the gaming side, the Bethesda, you know, they've they've really pushing the Xbox Game Pass as a subscription service. Again, this is another element that will fit into that, um, the, you know, the, the gaining traction on that social side in, in gaming as well. Where Microsoft don't really have much of a presence. Um, so, you know, again, I think it's that it's a much wider view that you need to take a look at this rather than just oh they're buying a uh, a chat and an audio uh, platform it's how that fits into the the bigger strategy um, yeah really uh, although I, I did read one that said that discord's all hosted on google's cloud at the moment yeah I did and actually that. saying you know you, you think about the size and the, the volume of stuff that's going through there if they can get that moved over to azure then i mean yes they're paying themselves but there's another push towards Azure. I didn't quite see that one because where the money's coming in would be coming into themselves anyway, but my, I, I can see some logic in wanting to get more Azure usage rather than Google. It's a techno possibly. technological challenge though, I mean, as well. Mm -hmm. Taking something like that and being able to move it over seamlessly. <laughs> oh, no, it's all in oh, containers, yeah. you just lift and shift. It's that easy is, these days. Is, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. We've, seen, we've, seen them, we've seen them try and do this before with other platforms where they've tried to Move <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and that went really well as well and, and linkedin as well i've heard some stories yeah. about linkedin back in the day um and yeah. uh, how it was uh, then completely rebuilt uh, effectively um but yeah some big undertaking there yeah so it, interesting all, all rumors at the moment nothing confirmed but uh, I, it certainly feels like a sensible move to me um other nice article that came out I think this was yesterday or a couple of days ago. Um, another one, we, we've talked about the Work Lab um, site from Microsoft where, as I say, exploring the science of work and ingenuity, really looking at numbers. And what they were looking at this time was the next great disruption is hybrid work. Uh, are we ready? And I, th this is really the move back to the office that uh, I think we were talking about last summer and that happened very briefly and then certainly in the UK disappeared again. Uh, oh, I clicked on the actual article there. But this is really starting to talk about the longer term effects from the, the pandemic and people working from home and starting to evolve that, that it's not at home or at work. It's going to be that hybrid and allowing people to work wherever they are. Uh, and and the, the kind of process of work. I, I know, Gary, we've talked a lot about async communications, but it's not just where you're working but how your work needs to change as well how do you get a feel for an organization when you can't see them how how do you make sure that people can be in the right places how do you make sure that people have those moments where they disconnect the virtual commutes and uh, piece on there to keep the the mental health um on that one and i think this is going to be a big trend a, a, a big movement that they're looking there as they say in here flexible work is here to stay uh i despite what Goldman Sachs may want everyone back in the office. I think many organisations are using this opportunity, whether it's for the he the, uh, the health of their workers or whether it's for saving money on big buildings, especially in the centre of London. I, I couldn't possibly comment, but uh, I, I think flexible work will come in and be the norm rather than the difference as it has been. Um, it's going to depend on the industry. It's going to depend on the whole lot of factors. But I think the thing about this this article is it is looking 
at society as a whole, as opposed mm. to, you know, just the knowledge worker industries or, you know, just the banking industries. It's it is looking at society and saying, what are the impacts of this this change? What is going to actually happen? You know, who's thriving? Whether it's different generations, whether it's working mums, whether it's business leaders, it's trying to be, yeah, higher level than just really really targeting. I guess the industries that are most likely to um, to adopt a hybrid work um, stance, because I think it's the ramifications are massive from everything from public transport to um, catering and foods, employment incentives. Yeah, just you know, general shops. Yeah, WH Smiths in stations will be panicking. Yeah, because I mean, UK. if you think about London, you know, London is a it's a bit of a donut. Everybody lives around the outside and the centre is not many people living there. So if you don't have that footfall coming in or you have, you know, people working in London two days a week, 40 percent of the time, you have 40 percent of the footfall. Mm. There's going to be a lot of a lot of companies that are going to suffer with that. Yeah, I, th- I think it's, it's interesting. I was reading through this um you know when it, when it got released and it was it's interesting to to look at the detail that they go into like mm-hmm. you know basic the pinpointing it that was, was kind of highlighted in the article about people just being exhausted mm-hmm. but the, but the being necessarily picked up on so productivity is high and you think oh productivity is high then people are you know happy where it's actually kind of it, it's high productivity but people are exhausted by the intensity of the day and that the intensity of the work that we're doing now because we're having to have video chats uh, uh, video calls and and and, and chats is that it, it, it's different to, to how we would have dealt with you know person-to-person um meetings uh face-to-face sorry um and and I, I really like the the demographics that it goes into as well and it really looks at the different generations of who's been impacted um the most um you know we're, we're talking about people have just joined the workforce it during the pandemic as well and, and 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 what impact it's had on them as opposed to say the business leaders um as well um and sorry it, I, i'm just gonna I'm, I'm distracted playing with this now gary it's very good uh, yeah <laughs> actually as you scroll the mouse that I, I was trying to work out where the numbers were zero but as you scroll the mouse you can see the numbers increase that is very cool it's, it's okay. very clever it works on the mobile as well so i was viewing this on my phone and i was like oh this has got stuck and as i was swiping it just kind of went through the chart and and went through the timeline but you know you can see just the the increase of intensity and yes we yeah. did have that that christmas break but then it's ramped up even higher um it's just carried on um it, it increasing and it's and and i just love i I've got to counter something you said there that your your productivity up. I, I'd seen other stats. I haven't seen if it's in an article, but actually productivity is down because the the amount of time people are spending is higher. People are spending a lot more time in meetings. It was talking there that, you know, the average meeting is going from 30 to 45 minutes long. Uh, the number of messages being sent are higher. Everyone's working harder. But actually the outputs that are coming through are actually less because people are getting frazzled and not able to work as uh, effectively and I think this is this is part of the problem as well it's now everyone's throwing time into it without necessarily getting the the, uh, the boost to the work that's coming out from there I mean that's a that's a productivity measure that's you know entangled into all sorts of other social things you know all of mm. that distraction you know I mean we've talked about it in the past around you know focusing and actually being able to to get work done as opposed to being engaged and collaborating you know that balance is not is not an easy one to find. Um, we'll, yeah, have a, we'll have an episode on books soon. We'll talk about uh, Cal Newport's latest book and yeah. the uh, the hyperactive hive mind workflow and the adverse impacts of that. But you know, it is everybody's distracted. Everybody's not distracted in a oh, I'm just daydreaming, but distracted in a I'm being pestered by Teams messages or Slack messages or email or my phone or LinkedIn. It's all. Distracting people all at the same time. <laughs> Absolutely. And <laughs> um, talking of book club, that that is one of our upcoming uh, episodes uh, that we're we're planning on there. If anyone's interested and wants to talk about a book they've read, drop us a line on Twitter or or directly to one of us. Uh, at, uh, if you know us via LinkedIn or any of the others, uh, if you'd like to come and appear, because we'd love to have some guests talking about books they've read recently that will be interesting. So. Uh, 
throw that in mid-show just to keep everyone awake. Um, g- going on to the, the, the kind of work lab, I think the numbers that come from that, the uh, really driving the employee experience um, and Microsoft's big pitch, obviously, for employee experience, as we talked a few shows back, was uh, on Microsoft Fever. And this, uh, no, sorry, next Friday, I think it is, or 31st of March, yeah. um, whatever that is, they're going to be releasing the, uh, the, the, what's it, the PowerShell modules that will enable Viva connections on the desktop to to be turned on. So uh, hopefully everyone has already planned and turned on the, the app bar on the left, um, uh, sorry, set the home sites within SharePoint and I think you can now turn on the, the the app bar is starting to appear I know it was in our demo tenant um, uh, which by the way I forgot to mention to everyone I've, I've turned on the home sites for that uh, <laughs> uh, right. what was that you were talking about change control, control? yeah how yeah, did yeah. you test it oh no well maybe uh, oh, we'll, we'll talk about that that's later. part two yeah um, so yeah that, that will be coming on so people will be able to you, you do have to actively turn it on now you may think, oh, fantastic! I'll go into Central Admin or, or sorry, the Microsoft 365 Admin and just flick a switch. No, not a chance. You need PowerShell for this. Uh, you need to be a full admin. Uh, you need what, what's it? Teams admin permissions or higher to apply the app in the Teams Admin Center. It's not yet supported in the Teams mobile app. Only modern SharePoint pages, uh, sites, and pages can be viewed in Teams. On there so that there's a whole list of important caveats uh that will be coming for it but uh, it will be great to see that and see the the next big pillar of uh viva go live after viva topics which is there you can use now uh viva connections will be next and uh, your intranets won't be the same <laughs> is that a threat or a promise <laughs> <laughs> you'll have to ask microsoft on that one uh Talking vaguely on Teams, where was the one? Uh, something I noticed, I think it was Paul Bullock uh, who shared this that, that I picked up on, um, but Microsoft announced a new tool for managing large groups, um, which is really where you have those large Microsoft 365 groups. Being able to manage the, the membership of that can be quite painful, and so they've open sourced a tool to make it a bit easier. So not having to write your own scripts and own details on there, uh, it deploys into Azure. Uh, interestingly, I noticed PowerShell. I, I, I was about to say that. <laughs> yeah, you just thought, I thought it was like, no, go to PowerShell 7. <laughs> I'll say or later, so we'll, we'll, we'll give them that one on there. Um, and it's got some scenarios where the tool can help. So, for example, corporate communication manager, manager Megan wants to set up a Microsoft Teams for their North America sales leader, Adele. Uh, a member of that team could include everyone in sales in US and Canada, plus the global support. So there's over 700 members there, and this tool will help to manage that. I also see from this that it can help set up sync. And, and one of the issues I had a client not that long ago was, was exactly that, where they had their AD security groups that were already using on premises. Uh, so they weren't Microsoft 365, purely security ones. When you add those into Teams, which you can do, but it takes a snapshot of the membership of there at that point in time. Um, this tool looks like it will be able to keep that, that in sync. So as people uh, are added or removed from that group, this should be able to keep in sync. I will be honest, I haven't tried it, so I can't confirm 100%, but it certainly talks about setting up the sync for this group as well. So it looks nice. We'll assume, I'm glad you've just clicked on the uh, architecture diagram. Yes, here we go. So we've got lots of Azure resources that are going to be needed to drive this. And that's one of the things of moving to the cloud, right? You're not going to be running this on your own servers. Mm. So there's there's some associated cost to yeah. uh, to running this. So, you know, databases, well, functions. I was going to say but, not much, but yeah, as you say, yeah. Contoso HR database. Um, for user information. So, yeah, be, be interested to know what's that, that. To me, most of the other things on there, you know, like a jobs table, this is your storage. That's yeah. relatively cheap. Logic apps and triggers, or oh, sorry, that's functions there, isn't it? Relatively cheap, but databases uh, aren't that cheap. Yeah. So. And managed identity, which I'm glad to, to be seeing in an architecture diagram uh, after yeah. talking about it quite, quite a bit recently. 
uh, just <laughs> makes things a bit, a bit easier and very, very secure. Um, but it's it's having that conversation, right? You're going to need to deploy it somewhere. Um, you're going to need a subscription, something to, to, to pay for that um, as well. Um, those are always the interesting conversations to have with our customers who are not necessarily wanting to uh, use all the benefits of, uh, of Azure for um, for these services. Absolutely. But I guess that goes that goes for any conversation around this type of automation, doesn't it? Automation, synchronization. Synchronization is always going to have some kind of cost. Yeah. But yeah, apart from the database, it seems a relatively cheap one well, like okay. that. But, and it uh, does depend on whether that database is ingesting membership from an HR system and then yeah. using it to create teams as opposed to using AD. AD security yeah. groups is one thing, but yeah. you know, that would be a real benefit for that kind of solution. So certainly, certainly well worth a, a look on there. Uh, next one, plenty of developer news this week, Gary, just uh, keep me awake, which is good. Um, this one was on Teams. So four device capabilities developers can utilize for Microsoft Teams mobile apps. Yeah, I really like this when I saw it. It was a um, bit of a, ooh, didn't expect to see any, any of this, but effectively there's a JavaScript SDK um, that you can use when building Teams apps. So maybe an ISV building, uh, you know, a web-based uh, app that you're going to put and run in Teams, and now you've got the ability to hook into um, the device capabilities. So cameras, microphones, uh, QR code um, scanners, location as well, which I think we've all been very used to, uh, which seems strange. Now, the Power Apps has had it for ages, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, we just kind of take it for granted, but it was it's nice to see that this is coming across to the the, the dev side, um, mm. the, the code side, um, just to make that a little bit easier. Um, so yeah, that was a, a, a nice surprise. So Gary, for, for a non-codey person like myself, uh, what, what are the scenarios where you would be building out something for a mobile device? Is this a native? Is this a native audio app? From. <laughs> yeah. I mean, but is this a native app or is this a Teams app that then has access to the device? Um, so this would be, I guess, if you're you're running it in um, uh, the uh, in, in the web. So you may be running this in uh, Azure App Service, um, mm -hmm. and you know you're pushing your app out to multiple. Um, customers multiple tenants because um, you're hosting teams. that but yeah it's really yeah. in teams so it's so yeah. rather than having to embed a, a power app a canvas app for example it yeah. would be if you were to build a custom application and actually yeah. build it turn it into a teams application you'd be able to make use of the device yes yeah yeah, yeah that is it so which is really something like really, i think of is you, you're, you're doing a meeting for people who are out on the road, let's say surveyors or something, you could build into the app the ability to take a photo of a building during a meeting. So obviously you can have a Teams meeting app. You could have it take photos and store that against the location. You could pick up your location on there. Say you're a property management company, go out, take the photo, know your location. You can have in your central database a list of those properties. Uh, big big P, not metadata properties, uh, and you could tie that image directly to that. Now, it, it, as you're saying there, Al, I think a lot of this stuff, yes, you could do those things in Power Platform, but for this case, it's if you had other things that you couldn't necessarily do in Power Platform, for example, you weren't on premium licenses and you wanted to talk to other APIs, here you can build your apps to, to go and do that. So I, I think it's, I, I think, there's edge cases for it. I don't think there'll be a massive amount that people will be able to use there, but those no, could but be some really nice. You know, taking photos from the board in meetings. It's that inter, it's that integration point with legacy applications where you don't have the power platform and you don't want to use yeah. you know a yeah. canvas app. You know, it is it is a different a different opportunity to actually make the most of what we know are really useful capabilities on a mobile device. Yeah, if you, you know, it's, it's different scenarios, right? If you want to do something just internal, potentially you might go down the, the power platform route and, and get something, you know, created you know, quite quickly and, and, and use, you know, all the services that you get in there. But then, you know, there's there's a whole ISV story as well that needs mm -hmm. to be catered for where, you know, mm -hmm. people don't want to build and, and deploy individual apps into different tenants. You want to build it once and reuse it. Um, and, and obviously the power platform has challenges in, in that scenario as well. Yep. So you, you want to, you know, um, go to those uh, alternatives. And it's good that 
Microsoft see that as things that they need to add uh, mm -hmm. as well to help with that story. You know, we've got Viva um, coming. There's a big opportunity there for um, uh, for for ISVs to kind of get into Teams and into Viva, and these things help um, with that definitely. Absolutely. And to do a lot of those things uh, is likely you'll need for building those out uh, the SharePoint framework, which leads me neatly on yeah. to the uh, next topic, which is the latest version of the SharePoint framework. Now I'm going to drop Gary into it here. Um, <laughs> what's what's changed? What's exciting about uh, this? Well, I should have warned uh, you about this, but I've only just thought about it. Yeah, that's true. I, 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 let's say that this is more of a uh, kind of like a, a bit more of a maintenance um, update uh, than anything else. Um, it's kind of getting things ready for things that are going to be coming. So we know that Viva is going to be coming. There's going to be, you know, extra features coming coming down the line, which is highlighted later on in the in, in the article. But there's a couple of things that uh, have been needed um, in SharePoint framework. So it's it's been using an old version of Node that is painful for handling different versions on your machine. Mm -hmm. So the Node That's version's been increased. Well. That is good news. Gulp has also been uh, updated as well. TypeScript's been updated. MP, uh, sorry, React has been updated as well. Office UI Fabric has been updated. You know, it, it's a lot of these kind of packages being updated to bring um, the latest and greatest features that it's, other web developers have, have had into the framework. I say, it's funny reading this because I, I thought before reading this in detail that it was more about some of the team's extensibility and there was a lot of things there which it kind of touches on so the ability to build as, as i was talking about that app where you can have it running as a teams app meeting that's only yeah. come with 112 it, it's that was out already but anyway. yeah there's there's it does say in there that, that it's basically preparing uh the framework for that um, unfortunately as i mentioned in the article there's a server side issue which obviously the, the sharepoint framework won't be able to fix because that's something in in sorry uh, there's a there's a server uh, th th there is, yeah. There's a VM somewhere, it's just not working. Um, but yeah, the, it, that uh, scenario that, that you described there, Kev, is is something that's coming. Um, right. The framework yeah. has been updated to take advantage of that. When the server side issue is resolved, you'll you'll then be able to uh, start building those kind of experiences. Okay. So yeah, at least you can start building out your, your versions now ahead of that and. Uh... Yep, um, and if you I'm want to upgrade, up and testing it, which, uh, yeah. we'll get onto in a minute. Uh, and if you want to upgrade, you can use the CLI for Microsoft 365. And we released the uh, upgrade to 112 the day 112 was released, so you could go straight away um, to the new version. Keep everything up to date. Very nice. Uh, talking about the stuff going on, I don't think we've talked about uh, Doctor before. Maybe, maybe we should go back to there. But the the latest version of uh, what's now Elio Stroyf's tool, um, really about maintaining your documentation on SharePoint. So where you have a lot of your Markdown files that you've maybe written uh, to document your apps, but you want to be able to share it internally via SharePoint, this tool helps you do it, which I, I think is really nice. Yeah, I really like this. I've seen the, uh, it's at version 1.10 um, and it's got there pretty quick actually. Um, the original idea is basically a static site generator for SharePoint. You've just got lots of markdown files. You can uh, basically point the, um, the doctor to your markdown files and it will generate the SharePoint pages for you. And it does all sorts of images and headers and you, know, you can build really nice sites and site maps and links and all that kind of stuff. Kind of what you'd have with, you know, lots of static site generators out there. Like you know, you've got, uh, I use Jekyll for, for my blog, uh, which is static site generator. You've got Gatsby, um, Hugo, few few others that named, but it's interesting that Elio's use SharePoint for that and creating modern pages and um, so yeah I really like the the way that he's taken this uh, it uses CLI for Microsoft 365 commands under the scenes uh, behind the scenes as well so he's been really active um, adding things into the CLI as well which has been great for us and um, mm. definitely so we've got lots of uh, commands in there for for managing page content uh, in the uh, in the CLI now 
Well, I'm, I'm certainly interested in this. We've still got our Microsoft 365 etiquette site, and I've managed to move each of those elements to very small markdown snippets. Mm -hmm. And part of it was the viewers that would make it easier to put into SharePoint. And as I was doing that, Elio managed to come out with Doctor. So uh, it's fantastic. Uh, one of my next tasks, if I ever get any time again, uh, is to be able to take those and, and have a way to kind of pick what you want from certain keywords and have that publish out to a SharePoint page internally so you can share that etiquette for the ones that you want internally. So, uh, yeah. Uh, nice. and, and just a, a final point on this, um, as we were talking about, we're going to be talking about testing later. Uh, Elio has done so much testing on this. Yeah. Um, he basically runs tests every six hours and it does a build on um, three different operating systems, checks all the time. It's all run through GitHub Actions. It is incredibly impressive. Uh, he's yeah. done a really good job with that. Um, it just goes to show, you know, what you can do um, when you, you kind of build all that automated testing in to make sure that, yeah, everything is working uh, as it was. Okay, going to rattle on before we test Al's stomach too much. Um, <laughs> interesting announcement, which I think we we all seen a bit before the show, but hadn't really delved into, and that's that the Microsoft Dataverse Custom API General Availability was announced. We had to kind of admit we didn't really know what the Custom API. I think my initial thoughts was it was the API for accessing Dataverse, which it kind of is. But as we've dug into it, it's really about creating wrappers around your Dataverse tables and uh, other elements, I guess, within Dataverse so that you could have, say, call an API. I think it's an example on one of these pages. I've lost where it's gone now, but uh, it, it was a great one. So you could use SQL to query the, the Dataverse data and you could join multiple tables and bring those all back as one call. So where you've kind of maybe split down your data into multiple levels, such as um, maybe you had like a, an asset catalog held in Dataverse and you've got that low level items and categories and you wanted to bring all those up into one call, then you can create that and publish that. And that, that can all be done via the uh, the maker portal, which is, yeah, interesting. I, I think. It is quite interesting. I mean, certainly surfacing custom ways to interact with your Dataverse tables is a really useful tool to be able to do and using the maker portal to be able to create that api rather than using you know more codey things should we say more debby mm. things you know it's kind of keeping with the mindset of low code no code um, well, whilst essentially using, it's got both which is, yeah. which is yeah brilliant really nice i mean certainly there's there's areas that we've been developing things that you know use this kind of model but then just to have it there, it's kind of like, well, wait a second, that completely changes. Yeah. In I've frozen, haven't I? <laughs> no, it's Al. Oh, it's Al. <laughs> I, can, I can work out if that was me or Al. Sorry, everyone. Oh, uh, I'm, yeah. still, I'm still moving. Still Having moving. some network fun. Uh, we, we got him back there. Sorry, Al. Uh, I think you were saying, yeah, that that ability to be able to to create and wrap around your your data models and make that available yeah. to other things, fantastic. You know, certainly for for integration purposes, you know, mm -hmm. those it's great. Yeah, so yeah, I, I think an unheralded announcement, but uh, lot, lots of possibilities for those in the the Power Platform, whether you're low code or pro code. I'd say no code, but yeah. Looking at the picture there, how old that is, I, I think you may struggle slightly, but uh, nothing, nothing stopped you. Give it a go. Become a bit low code on there. Uh, OK, that was the end of our news. We're on to uh, well, I neatly term events and ego posts, although not, not too many of the ego posts uh, this week. Uh, first one, just want to call out, uh, we've mentioned Commsverse a lot. Uh, and uh, they are doing a lovely thing talking about the Tech Community Awards. So really celebrating community champions who are going out there and doing stuff in the community. Nominations close on the 31st of March. So please go out. That There are so many people who do such really good stuff out in the community. Uh, I love that they're, they're helping celebrate this. So uh, do get your nominations in for that. Uh, if you go to commsverse, sorry, online.commsverse.com slash awards and uh, Go and nominate a few people and let them know um, what you think. 
Uh, other events we've got coming up, uh, I think Al, you and Peter have got the Microsoft 365 Security and Compliance coming up on the 31st. We do indeed, yeah. Some really good sessions from Albert and Tice. And yeah, I think there's, uh, we're getting a growing number of people. So I think we've got 80 odd registered to attend that. So it should be, uh, it should be a really good session. And uh, yeah, some really, uh, we've got some super speakers for this week, this month, but also we've got some fantastic speakers lined up for the coming months as well. So uh, yeah, pop along, sign up, get notified when we put new events on um, and follow us on Twitter. Lovely. Uh, I think the uh, Peter Rising who we had on uh, when we were talking about Ignite is uh, talking at the uh, Teams, I'm getting these all the way around, Teams Day Online 3. Uh, it's confusing me by being on the web website Modern Workplace Summit, but uh, yeah, there's a, a whole set of events that are coming up on the 7th of April, which should be fantastic. Um, there's also Teams Nation, which was going to be soon, wasn't it? But the date of that's now changed, Al, I think, to 12th of May. And uh, our Karen talking because Al seems um, to be freezing <laughs> slightly there. So, yeah, the Teams Nation, I, I think the call for speakers is still open on that one, um, but it's due to carry on, uh, due to take place on 12th of May. So I uh, can't tell you who's going to talk because the call for speakers is still open on that one. So still waiting for people to submit stuff uh, on that, which should be great. And last, we can't finish without a bit of a birthday because on the 27th of March is SharePoint's 20th birthday. And I'm going to apologise because that will be making quite a few of our listeners feel a little bit old at this point. Um, I, I know for many of us, it's been there throughout much of our careers. I, for me, I was there since 2003. 2003, 2004, when I first started using SharePoint, and it's really has been fundamental for what I do. So uh, the the organisers of the European Collab Summit are putting on a bit of a party. They've they've got plenty of old stories. There'll be lots of old wizened people talking about the good old days. And don't you remember You're gonna be there, just deploy solutions? <laughs> <laughs> do, yeah, definitely wizened. Not that that's just wise. So I, I'm not sure that's okay, quite, sorry. quite quite me. But uh, yeah, I hope to be there. They're gonna have it on all space VR. You know, this modern VR technology. God, who would have <laughs> thought that back in the day? But uh, I think just just a chance to have some fun and celebrate uh, with how things have come along. So. Uh, do sign up for that. I think there'll be plenty of people. It's going to be global. There's slots all around the world. So uh, keep an eye on that. SharePointBirthday.com. Any any other bit? Oh, uh, there was Gary. I've just realised we've missed. You're going to be speaking at the uh, Aaron Rendell's uh, South Coast User Group, Microsoft Cloud South Coast User Group as well. Yeah, uh, so I've got a session on there, a bit of a, a dev session. So going to go through CLI for Microsoft 365. As we mentioned, you know, SharePoint Framework, um, new version has just been released. i um, going to show you how to upgrade your projects and all of the little utilities that we've got in there to uh, make your life a little bit easier as a SharePoint Framework developer. So, yes, that should be good. Uh, we'll wrap up the news there and move quickly on to uh, the second part of the show where we're going to be talking about testing. So we will be getting testy in part two. Join us. Uh, join us later. Ah, no, I've just remembered it won't be later. So if you are listening to this, we're going to be releasing part one uh, today and then we'll be releasing the testing this time next week. So you will have to hold out. Tested it. Once we test it fully and made sure it works. <laughs> Suggesting I test some of the stuff, you know, Al, I don't do that, I think. But we'll talk about that in part two. Uh, thank you very much and see you next week.